Welcome to EC203. This is now the third and final lecture on the design of instrumentation amplifiers to amplify biopotential signals. Now, if you haven't seen the first two lectures, it is highly encouraged that you go back and, and look at those two lectures. Uh, we're going to be continuing basically right where we left off. So one thing that I'd like to discuss now uh, when it comes to instrumentation amplifiers is what is the best way to benchmark our designs? Uh, you know, let's say you've designed an instrumentation amplifier and you want to compare it to products available on the market or other designs that have published in the literature. What we often do in circuit design is we like to come up with something we call a figure of merit. Uh, it's some uh, a metric that comprises ideally some sort of fundamental trade-off associated with this type of design and we see how well our particular design is doing with respect to this fundamental trade-off. Now I should mention uh, some people like to come up with their own figure of merits that have no basis on fundamental things um, and it's just you know taking power and bandwidth and noise and area and you know whatever else you want and kind of multiply or divide them all together um, and then typically when someone uh, proposes a new figure of merit of course their design happens to be the best in, in this figure of merit that's not a coincidence but really good figure of merits um, uh, or figures of merit um, is uh, based on fundamental trade-offs. Um, and, and these are figures of merit that tend to um, uh, stick around for a long time. So the figure of merit that we're going to talk about today is called noise efficiency factor. And what we do here is we compare the power, or rather the current, and the input referred noise of our instrumentation amplifier that we're building or designing or have designed. And we compare it to the input referred noise of a single bipolar transistor. Okay, so we haven't talked much about bipolar transistors. So let's quickly go through and derive what the input referred noise of a bipolar transistor is. So it turns out that BJTs um, are dominated by shot noise. Uh, and so as a result, we actually already know what the input referred noise or what the rather current uh, noise is of a BJT. It's the same thing as a subthreshold MOSFET. It's 2Q IC, where IC is the collector current of the, of the BJT times delta F, of course. So it also turns out that the transconductance for a BJT is something very similar to what we've seen. It's IC divided by phi T. Okay, so it's very similar to a subthreshold MOSFET. Both of them are exponential mode devices. In this case, the BJT doesn't have the subthreshold coefficient, the factor of n, in their transconductor uh, model. And as a result, BJTs actually do have better um, transconductance efficiency than a subthreshold MOSFET. So the input referred noise, we can just uh, divide by the transconductance. Um, I'm gonna just divide this by delta F over here to make things easy. So that's 2QIC divided by GM squared. Note that we have to square it because we're dealing with noise terms here. So this is equal to 2Q, uh, we can replace GM squared. This is phi T squared over IC uh, squared, but the IC uh, on the top cancels out the square there. So it's just over IC which is equal to 2Q phi T over IC. And then I'm gonna take this out as KT over Q. That's what phi T is equal to. So this is equal to 2KT phi T divided by IC. Okay, so what we see here is that for a bipolar transistor, the input referred noise is inversely proportional to the collector current. Okay, so, so far so good. So the noise efficiency factor, this figure of merit, was defined uh, in reference one, uh, shown on the bottom of the slide here, as the following formula. NEF is equal to the input referred noise, uh, RMS, so integrated over some bandwidth, times the square root of the total current. And I should specify here that this is the total amplifier current. Uh, which includes all branches in the amplifier and all current sources and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so any place that's consuming current in your amplifier, you must sum all of those currents up and that's what I total would be here. Now V in 
RMS is just the um, total integrated uh, input referred noise, um, assuming uh, over uh, bandwidth BW, okay, which is shown in the numerator uh, of this square root function. So it's the in total input referred noise times the square root of I total divided by phi t times 4kt times bandwidth times pi over 2. So you can understand perhaps why bandwidth times pi over 2 comes into play here. Uh, this is uh, taking into account this, um, uh, you know, assuming it's a first order roll off and we're doing the integration. And so we basically take the 3 dB bandwidth multiplied by pi over 2. And that's part of the part of the formula here. So they're assuming there's a first order filter somewhere in, in, in the circuit. So if we've done our job correctly, a single bipolar transistor, um, you know, we could go ahead and compute what the noise efficiency factor of that bipolar transistor is. And if we've done our job correctly, we should get a value of one. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, the input referred noise of our bipolar transistor is 2kt phi t divided by ic. And then we're going to integrate it over some bandwidth times pi over 2. Uh, to get the RMS, uh, we have to take the square root. So we multiply everything together here, and what we end up getting is 1 over root 2, which is equal to 0 0.707. So, huh? What happened here? We defined our figure of merit based on a single bipolar transistor. And then when we plug in a single bipolar transistor into this formula, it doesn't cancel out. We don't get a factor of one, we get 0 0.707. So what the heck is going on here? Well, it turns out that in, in that reference we cited here, um, the authors incorrectly say, cited, stated that the input referred noise of a bipolar transistor is 4 kT delta F over GM, perhaps because it looks more similar to the resistor noise formula, I'm not really sure. Uh, but in reality, it should be 2 kT delta F over GM. Okay, so that's a, precisely where this one over root two discrepancy comes from. So despite this being um, not the correct formula for which the derivation happened for, we still use for historical reasons, the original definition of noise efficiency factor, um, just because uh, all of the other work in the literature that has been published since then use that original definition. And we wanna make sure we're doing a fair apples to apples comparison between everything. Um, so do use that uh, the boxed definition I showed in in the previous slide. Um, and and you know frankly, as long as everybody uses the same definition, uh, the tr the fundamental trade-off is still there. It's just off by a factor of uh, of of one over root two, uh, based on you know some arbitrary device model that that was selected here. So it's it's not a big deal that it's off as long as we all use um, the same formula. So now we can go ahead and try and figure out what the NEF of a subthreshold differential pair uh, is, assuming MOSFET transistors. So if you recall from previous lectures, we had derived the input referred noise of a uh, five transistor OTA, and that was equal to 4kT n squared phi t over, um, over the um, current of one of those input pairs. The total bias current um, is, um, I bias, um, and so I bias over two is what is flowing in each one of those individual transistors that comprise the differential pair. So what we can go ahead and do is, is we can put this into the NEF formula, 4kT n squared phi t over I bias over two times bandwidth times pi over two, um, you know, whatever bandwidth uh, we're measuring this over, those terms just cancel out in the end anyways. Right, so this term cancels out with this term, et cetera. And if you plug everything through, what you end up getting is the square root of two n squared, okay? Um, or root two times n, which is approximately equal to two for n equals 1.5. So if you have a CMOS process that has an n of 1.5, then the best NEF you can do with a single uh, differential pair is two, okay? Um, which is, you know, a nice kind of theoretical limit for subthreshold MOSFET differential pair. So if you see someone reporting an NEF less than two, which does happen in the literature, 
then clearly they're not doing something basic. They're not doing just a subthreshold differential pair. Maybe they're doing some current reuse strategy or, or, or something like this. So it is possible to get an NEF lower than two if you do these kind of alternative techniques. But if you're only doing a differential pair, we can say that in practice, um, a, a, let's call it a simple, I guess simple is not the right word, but I guess we'll go with it. Simple, simple diff pair uh, based circuits uh, report NEFs of, you know, 2.5 to 4.0, something like this. This is a, a reasonable range for something that you can expect to see in the literature uh, unless they start doing some current reuse kind of things. Now I should mention that the NEF is a figure of merit that is derived only from uh, shot or, or, or thermal noise. Um, and so as a result, you have to be careful here, right? So we've, we just derived the, the, the previous formula there, assuming that our transistors only had shot noise, but we know that they also have flicker noise and flicker noise can be a big important thing in our circuits. Um, and so if you just take your differential pair and if it has shot noise only and it has an NEF of two, if you then go ahead and add flicker noise on top of that, the NEF is gonna be much larger. Um, so we're going to have to figure out ways for, for, for us as designers to figure out how to deal with this uh, flicker noise. So let's just go through a quick numerical example of what would happen if we have a, um, let's, let's pretend this is the uh, Reed Harrison based um, instrument or Reed Harrison based OTA. And uh, given the parameters that we, that we show here, we're gonna assume that the designer has done a good job and they've made uh, the differential pair uh, to operate in subthreshold and the other transistors are operating in above threshold. And so as a result, the shot noise or the thermal noise based um, uh, input referred noise is completely dominated by that input pair. Um, and let's furthermore say that in this particular design, the resulting shot noise or the resulting NEF that we get based purely on the shot noise uh, is equal to four. And you'll note that this is not equal to two because we do have to burn current in the other branches um, despite us not um, having to worry about the noise being generated by those other transistors because we've done our optimization correctly. So let's just say that the, the NEF of that particular design, plugging in all the numbers and so on is equal to four. Now what I'd like to do is say, well, we know that we, we, we don't just have shot noise in this, in this uh, design, we also have flicker noise, okay? And so that's being modeled by this formula over here. Uh, so this should look pretty familiar to you. Uh, it has the um, divided by GM uh, terms, uh, by, divided by GM1 terms and so on. But in this case, we now add the, uh, this is uh, derived for the one over F noise. So we have this KF um, P and KFN parameters and, and, and so on, which are given uh, at the top of the slide here. So I'm not going to go into the, the, the gory details of, of calculating everything out. We're going to assume again that this piece here is, is small. And so we're going to be dominated by the, um, the flicker noise of our uh, first device there. And so if we go ahead and put in the parameters that I've listed at the top of the slide here, assuming a bandwidth from 0.1 Hertz to 250 Hertz, what we end up getting is, is the, the following uh, amount of noise here. So um, the RMS uh, noise is 16.9 picovolts squared from shot noise only and 44.7 picovolts squared from the flicker noise. You add this together, you get 61 picovolt squared, which if you take the, the, the square root, gives you 7.8 microvolt RMS, which frankly is a little high for an instrumentation amplifier, particularly for one uh, that you may want to use for, for example, EEG systems. So if you go ahead and put in the 7.8 microvolt squared, uh, or sorry, microvolt RMS, uh, along with the bias current of 100 nanoamps that's flowing through all of the branches on the circuit, and you go ahead and compute the NEF, now, including the effects of flicker noise, you now get a value of six. Okay, so if you only had shot noise, your NEF was four, but now that we're adding the effects of flicker noise, the NEF is now six, all right? Um, nothing's changed in the circuit, we've just added an additional noise mechanism 
that is always there. Okay, so this is something that we do as designers have to deal with. We likely don't want to have this uh, flicker noise really ruining our noise efficiency factor like this. So what are some ways that we can use to mitigate the effect uh, or the impact of flicker noise? Well, as we saw in the previous slide, flicker noise is inversely proportional to W times L. So if we make our input transistors bigger, that's gonna help. Um, and in some cases that's good enough, right? We can have these pretty big input devices. Maybe L is quite big, W can be quite big as well. We wanted a big W over L for those input devices anyways, uh, in order to make sure that they dominate the shot noise um, uh, part of the instrumentation amplifier and, and not the, the rest of those uh, transistors uh, through the current mirrors and so on. So we do like doing this, but again, there's a trade-off here. If we make those input transistors too big, their input capacitance is going to get very large, and that's going to uh, result in some signal attenuation issues, as well as some uh, input referred noise uh, increase issues uh, when we input refer noise across the input coupling capacitor. So another solution uh, that we're going to talk about uh, today is called chopping. And the basic idea with chopping is that we know that the flicker noise is coming from the transistors in the amplifier itself. So the idea here is, well, the flicker noise is happening at these low frequencies. Is there any way that we can change the frequency content of the signal somehow such that it looks like it's existing at a higher frequency away from where flicker noise is happening? And if we can do so, maybe we can use the amplifier in, a, in its region of operation outside of the, the area where flicker noise is, is impacting it. We do this through a process called chopping, uh, which is very similar to the, or exactly similar to the concept called mixing in RF circuits. Um, so basically what we do is we take our input signal and we mix it up to a higher frequency, amplify it at this higher frequency where the amplifier isn't impacted by one over F noise, and then once we're done, we can mix it back down, uh, back to uh, baseband, as we would say in RF systems. Now there's a third solution uh, that can work um, called um, uh, auto zeroing and, and um, uh, uh, correlated double sampling. Um, we're not gonna have time to talk about that in, in, in this course, uh, but there is another option on the table uh, should you be interested in exploring it. So the idea of chopping is, is shown here. You have your input signal, and we may add some off-chip aggressors, uh, for example, 60 hertz interference. Um, you know, uh, chopping doesn't do anything uh, to this. And we, we model our input referred noise as coming right before the amplifier here. Okay, so when the signal comes in, in, in this picture here, our signal of interest is from 0.1 to say about 250 hertz. And we can see here that our flicker noise is basically, you know, bang, right on top of our signal of interest. In fact, uh, our shot noise floor is over here. So our corner frequency is say at around 100 hertz or something like this. So not until 100 hertz happens, does the impact of flicker noise not matter. Um, so this is, a, this is a big deal. Now, of course, on top of this, we have 60 hertz interference. We have electrode offset voltage um, issues that, that are showing up at uh, DC or very low frequencies and so on. So the idea with chopping is that before we encounter our input referred noise, what we do is we multiply by some chopping frequency. Okay, what that does is it up converts anything that came to the input over here. So that would be V in and any of these off-chip aggressors, okay, electrode offset voltage and 60 hertz interference. So this all gets up converted to some higher frequency. Now you'll note here that the effects of, of or the, the noise of the signal here is dominated purely by shot or thermal noise. There is flicker noise that exists there, but it's well below the shot or thermal noise floor. So it turns out that it doesn't really matter. So once we've up converted, then we go ahead and we amplify that of course will involve some input referred noise issues and then once we're done amplifying we chop it back down and basically we you know move it back down uh, to the original frequency at which point we can go through our analog to digital converter our digital signal processor you know etc okay so that's the the basic concept mathematically this works uh, based on trigonometry uh, again just like uh, what happens with mixing in rf circuits 
So if you take a signal, cosine of omega 1t, and you multiply it by cosine of omega 2t, then you get a sum of two cosines, um, where the frequencies of these cosines are the sum and the difference between these, these individual frequencies. So if we take our input signal and we multiply it by f chop, we will get uh, a, a signal over here that is at frequency f chop plus the you know frequency of our input signal. Um, so that's up converted to a much higher frequency, um, at which point we can do our amplification. And then to get our original signal back, all we have to do is multiply by that same f chop frequency, and it'll convert it right back down to the original frequency uh, that we were at, omega 1 plus omega 2 minus omega 2, as an example. Okay, so that's the mathematics. How do we do this with a circuit? Well, it turns out that we typically don't want to use like a Gilbert cell multiplier or something like this because, well, A, those generate noise and flicker noise in particular. Uh, and so that doesn't really work for us. Uh, what we tend to prefer to do is multiply by a square wave. And we can do this with a circuit called, well, a chopper. And the symbol is shown on the left here and the, the circuit implementation is shown on the right. The idea here is you basically take your input signal and when phi one is positive, you have the input signal pass um, undisturbed through to the uh, output of this uh, so-called chopper. So basically we're multiplying the signal by plus one. And then on the other phase, when phi two is active, we take our input signal and we pass it over here and up over here. Okay, so this is like multiplying it by minus one. So the red is plus one on when phase phi one is happening and phi two, it's like inverting the polarity of the signal. So in other words, it's like multiplying by minus one. So if we do this with uh, some you know, given frequency, it's basically like we're multiplying the signal by a square wave of plus one or minus one. So this is depicted here. We have our input sinusoidal signal. Um, let's say that's a, a model of our input. We'll call it VA. And we multiply by this chopping waveform that gets uh, that you know is a square wave uh, uh, between plus one and minus one. When we multiply them, we get a signal that looks something like this. Um, it's the you know the chopped up version of the signal. Uh, you can see it has some of the characteristics of our original signal, and of course the characteristics of the square wave. And if we multiply this uh, chopped up version of the signal by the original square wave again, and then we low pass filter appropriately, we end up getting our original signal back again. Okay, so this is exactly uh, what we want to be doing in order to uh, allow us to um, up convert the signal to a higher frequency and then recover the signal when we want to come back down. So how would, would, would we implement this in practice? Well, here's one possible way. We have our input um, chopper, and then we just put it right in front of the uh, capacity coupled instrumentation amplifier. Okay, uh, in this case, I'm showing this as a fully differential uh, capacitive, capacitive um, instrumentation amplifier. So this does work. Okay, uh, it does work. However, there are multiple downsides that we have to deal with here. Okay, so let's let's list them. Number one is that anytime you do chopping, uh, the op amp must operate and be stable at much higher frequencies than before, right? Before our op amp had to work at uh, 250 Hertz. Now it has to work at, well, it depends on your chopping frequency, maybe 10 kilohertz or something like this. Okay, so this requires uh, more GM and therefore more power. Okay, so in order to implement chopping, at least in this manner, we will have to consume more power. There's another downside that, that happens here. So what we're doing here is we're basically we're chopping the input in front of some capacitors. So we have some switches that are switching in front of some capacitors. So, so every time we switch the polarity of the input signal uh, by transitioning from phi one to phi two and back, 
then that means the voltage experienced by CI, the input coupling capacitors here, will be charged to a slightly different voltage based on the differential voltage between the inputs, uh, the, the differential inputs here. As a result, you're going to have to have some current that flows from the input source in order to charge and discharge um, these capacitors to, uh, to get them to their new voltage levels. So what I'm trying to say here is that this creates a switched capacitor input impedance. Just by putting those choppers in front of the capacitor, we are generating a switch capacitor input resistor whose value is given by 1 over 2 times CI times F chop. And for most practical values, this is on the order of something like 10 mega ohms, approximately. Okay, so this is a problem. Uh, we typically want our input impedance to be larger than 10 mega ohms. Uh, it, it's okay for some applications, uh, depending on the size of the electrode, but we typically do want it to be larger than 10 mega ohms. The final issue I want to, to, to bring up is that this is happening between the interface of the electrodes and the coupling capacitors, which means this is going to upconvert any electrode offset voltage. Right. So remember, we liked having these coupling capacitors because if we had electrode offset voltage, these coupling capacitors would just passively reject that volt, that offset voltage. Uh, and as a result, you know, we didn't have to deal with it. But now we're taking this DC offset voltage and we're multiplying it by a sinusoid. So it upconverts this DC voltage to basically a sinusoidal frequency, which of course passes very easily through CI. Okay. As a result, this can saturate the amplifier. Okay, so for example, um, just to put this in, in terms of numbers, let's say we have a 100 millivolt uh, electrode offset voltage, which is not unreasonable. And our amplifier has a gain of 40 dB, um, which is a gain of 100 in uh, linear terms. Well, we have 100 millivolts here, uh, a gain of um, 100 will require VDD of 10 volts, all right, which is not something we typically want to have in a CMOS process. Most CMOS processes do not handle 10 volts. So in other words, in this situation, the amplifier will definitely saturate, okay, and this is a problem. Okay, so we have to, as designers, do something about this. So this circuit does not work well if you expect, you know, appreciable amounts of electrode offset voltage. So th there's another issue that actually happens with this chopping approach, um, and it's it's kind of illustrated over here. This is uh, from a paper by uh, Tim, Tim Dennison and all. Um, and so th the issue here is that when you're chopping, you're chopping with a square wave. Okay, a square wave has theoretically an infinite number of harmonics. But then you're passing this modulated signal through an amplifier that does not have infinite bandwidth. Okay, it has a finite bandwidth. And as a result, some of those harmonics of this modulated signal get filtered out. All right, and then we multiply again by the same square wave, which has all of those harmonics back in it. But we're not. Um, but we've lost some of the harmonics as it's passed through the amplifier. So when we multiply things out to, to bring it back down, we end up getting some of these uh, residual um, uh, ripple uh, from the from the harmonics that were filtered out from from the amplifier. Okay. Um, so this is you know uh, problematic, right? We don't want to have this extra ripple here. I mean, there's things we can do to filter it and so on, but our filters aren't aren't perfect. We have some gain error issues that, that show up here and so on. So what can we do to solve this? Well, the, the first solution and, and one that is perhaps the, the, the easiest one to, to do, at least at first, is we actually prefer to chop down not after the entire voltage mode amplifier, but ideally after the very first stage of amplification. Um, 
you know, assuming that we have a two-stage amplifier or something like this. Ideally, what we want to do is chop down after, uh, sorry, before the first dominant pole. Okay, so typically when we build an op amp, we, we do some Miller compensation or something like this. We, we make sure that there's a strong dominant pole uh, to make sure that the um, amplifier is nice and stable when we put it in feedback. And if we can chop down before that dominant pole, then the bandwidth of that amplifier will instantaneously at that point be much higher. And as a result, um, when we chop down, um, uh, you know, we haven't lost a lot of these harmonics yet. And then we end up getting filtered by the dominant pole and so on. So this is actually a very nice uh, strategy. The other thing we can do is employ some feedback. So we can wrap an additional feedback loop uh, perhaps with an integrator uh, in order to null out any DC offsets that, that may occur, for example, for through electrode offset voltages. So these two things uh, will be discussed on the, on the next slide. And uh, a third strategy is, well, why don't we put the choppers after the coupling capacitor? We like those coupling capacitors because it allowed us to passively reject any electrode offset voltage. So could we potentially chop after the coupling capacitors, uh, we'll discuss that um, in two slides from now. So here's the solution, uh, uh, taking into account the, the first um, two suggestions here. So the, the, the first idea here is uh, we, we do chopping here. It's happening before the, the coupling capacitor, but we're going, to, we're going to break our amplifier into a transconductor and an integrator, okay? Um, and as a result, what we're going to do is we're going to chop down here. This is between the transconductor and the rest of the integrator that converts it back into a voltage domain signal. Okay, so this uh, inherently allows us, uh, the transconductor will have higher bandwidth. This allows us to more easily uh, capture some of those uh, harmonics that would otherwise be filtered out if we had moved the chopping point after that integrator. Now, this does set up an interesting problem or uh, circuit topology here, because now when we were at the output of the, the integrator here and we want to apply feedback, well, we want to feedback to before C int, we want to feedback over here, but at this point we're chopped up and yet over here we're chopped down. So if we have a feedback capacitor CFB, in order for this to work, we, have, we actually have to chop it up uh, before we are allowed to feedback, uh, just to make sure that we're feeding back at the right frequency, okay? So you have to add this extra chopper in the feedback loop in order to uh, make up for this. Um, the other thing that this circuit has added is an additional integrator here. Uh, again, we have to chop it back up to get it at the right frequency range. Uh, and this integrator is being used to, uh, uh, as kind of this uh, servo loop here in order to help us um, eliminate some of this uh, ripple and gain error and so on and so forth. So this is actually a very nice approach. Uh, it works nicely. Um, it still has this input impedance uh, issue with the chopper before the input coupling capacitor. Um, but other than that, you know, this actually does work quite well. But let's take a look at that other suggestion is saying, well, why can't we just chop after the coupling capacitors? Okay, um, this should solve the electrode offset voltage issue. Uh, and indeed it does. Okay, um, so, so this does solve that problem. Uh, and as you can see here, what we've done here is we've chopped um, right before the, the OTA um, within the, the, the feedback loop of the OTA and we're chopping down um, you know, either after the OTA or ideally more like in the middle of the OTA so that we don't uh, lose out some of these harmonic content. And, uh, and our gain is set by the ratio of C in and CFB. This is, this is all good. We have a feedback biasing resistors here uh, in order to set the bias points. And, um, and we still actually also have this uh, extra servo loop uh, with this extra transconductor here in order to uh, help uh, reduce um, the further chopping ripple and, and so on. So this circuit does work nicely as well. Uh, however, there's a, there is an uh, unintended issue that does come up here that we should discuss. So the chopping switches at the input of the OTA 
Um, the input transistors of that of that uh, of that OTA or op amp, I guess, um, have finite capacitance. Okay, and so those choppers in front of that finite capacitance creates a switch capacitor resistance, uh, just like it does with the um, choppers before the uh, input coupling capacitors. So in this case, it doesn't influence the um, it, it doesn't influence the electrode offset voltage at all um, because the electrode offset voltage is passively rejected by C in. Uh, it does reduce the input impedance of the of the amplifier. Um, you know that's it happens. Um, but more importantly, that resistance generates noise. Okay, so it's not a physical resistor, it's a switch capacitor resistor. Um, and, uh, but it turns out that you can model, you know, the, the noise, the effective amount of noise of a switch capacitor resistor. And it turns out to basically, at least within the band of interest, be 4KTR, or in other words, you know, the same noise that a normal resistor would generate. Um, so there's no free lunch here. But what's interesting is that when you take that resistive noise at the input of your OTA, and you refer it back to the input of your overall feedback amplifier in front of the input coupling capacitors, you'll find that those input coupling capacitors end up shaping what is nominally, within the band of interest anyways, a white noise component. It ends up shaping it to, to be a one over F squared component. Okay, um, and this can ruin your day. Uh, it turns out that if your input capacitors are not sufficiently large, uh, because the the amount of uh, shaping depends on the size of those input capacitors, then this one over F squared noise component can really uh, dominate your overall noise here. Okay, so as a result, this architecture does work. It does work very well. Uh, however, it works mostly well um, when you have very large input coupling capacitors. Okay, um, so for example, in the in the Verma paper, which, which is this is based from, uh, the input coupling capacitors are on the order of a nanofarad. Okay, um, this works if you're doing a couple channels of EEG or ECG or something like this. But if you're trying to do hundreds or thousands of channels for neural interfacing, this is not a desirable solution. Those nanofarad capacitors take up a lot of a lot of area. Um, so if you are looking for good project ideas, trying to address this problem might actually be a nice uh, project idea. So on that note, I would like to kind of further motivate what I was talking about here when we talk about how this is not a good idea for many channel neural interfaces. So what we typically are trying to do in, in neural interfaces is um, we're trying to record from as many channels as physically possible, typically, okay? Um, and as a result, we have this, uh, what we encounter is this uh, big issue in terms of um, channel count density. So we, we want each of our channels to be extremely small so we can fit more of them into, uh, in, into the same area. So this is actually nicely uh, illustrated by the, the following publication. It was made in, in 2011, so it's a little old now, but, um, but I think this nicely outlines where the literature had been going anyways. So it turns out there is a Moore's law in neuroscience. So from 1960 to at least in this case in, in 2011, the number of simultaneously recorded neurons has been doubling approximately every seven and a half years. So that is uh, exponential growth, which is a good thing, uh, but it's exponential growth that is way, way slower than Moore's law for semiconductors anyways. So when this particular paper was published, the state of the art was about 300 channels at once. Okay, which is impressive actually, um, but the human brain contains about 22 billion neurons and trillions of synapses. So trying to understand how the human brain works by recording from 300 channels is kind of like trying to figure out how all of the United States works by putting uh, you know, one camera in downtown San Diego. Okay, we are severely undersampling what is going on in the brain. Severely undersampling what's going on in the brain. We can't learn about how the brain's working by recording from 300 out of 22 billion neurons. So what we need 
is an inflection point. We need to be changing the number of our ability to increase the number of simultaneously recorded neurons. We need new neurotechnology to satisfy um, our ability uh, to experiment with and understand the human brain. And one of the biggest limiting factors is the interconnect. Okay, so these are uh, uh, two pictures from some work that we cited earlier. And, you know, for each electrode that we, that we generate, it needs a wire that goes to a chip, and then that chip is going to need to have an amplifier and, and so on and so forth. This occupies a ton of area, and this is really a major bottleneck in translating these neural interfaces to much larger uh, number of uh, channel counts. So there are many ways, many approaches that people are trying to uh, use to solve this. They're building uh, multiplexers right on the right on the electrodes. Um, they're trying to build better fabrication processes. They're trying to build um, uh, needle-like electrodes, you know, through some of the work at Neuralink and 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 so on. There's many possible approaches. Um, I'm going to tell you about one possible approach. Uh, this possible approach is, is something that uh, we've been uh, developing uh, here at UCSD. This is what we call a fully on chip wireless neural interfacing device. Uh, there are other uh, approaches related to this. Uh, we started publishing on this, I think, in 2014, 2015, if I uh, remember correctly. Anyways, the idea here is that um, we want to put the electrodes as close to the amplifiers and the digitizers and so on as possible. So why don't we just put the electrodes right on the chip? Uh, or maybe we post-process the chip to, to grow up the electrodes on top of it. So in this case, what we do is we build a fully wireless neural interface on chip. We take a single piece of silicon. In this particular case, it was three millimeters by three millimeters. We wrap a coil around the piece of silicon using the top metal layers. This coil is used for wireless power transfer. It's also used for telemetry. And uh, we rectify that power, we you know, convert it into DC power, and we run our amplifiers and our stimulators and so on. So the nice advantage of this is this chip is fully modular. It's fully integrated. There's no wires, there's no batteries, there's no external components or anything. And if we've done our job right, we can possibly integrate hundreds of channels uh, on, on a single chip. Um, it's totally wireless, totally modular, so you can tile many of these chips across the cortical surface, for example, uh, in order to get a very uh, high dense network uh, of devices. The chips are rigid. These are not flexible devices, uh, but they're designed to be small enough to fit within the folds and curves of the brain uh, so that uh, we, we don't have any mechanical compliance issues. Now this is one possible approach. Uh, my, my colleagues and I at uh, Brown University and, 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 and Qualcomm and others have also been investigating building tiny, tiny little chips, uh, free floating chips, less than 500 microns on a side with you know, one or two channels on them, something like this, um, you know, similar kind of approach uh, to this. So one of the challenges we, we have in these kind of architectures is how are we going to build our analog front ends or instrumentation amplifiers? We're probably not going to be able to do the, the top approach here uh, where we have a capacity coupled amplifier because uh, the size of those capacitors needs to be rather big and we just don't have space for big, um, for, for big capacitors. Um, now, or, or, and, and in addition, because there's no chopping going on here, the size of the input transistors in order to minimize the effects of flicker noise must be very large. Uh, and in fact, that's the principal challenge here is that these very large transistors, well, they make the amplifier big. Uh, and as a result, um, it's not scalable to many channels. So we could chop before the coupling capacitors. Uh, that, would make, that would allow us to use very small input transistors uh, so that's good, but then this has, um, you know, input impedance challenges. If we wanted to build purely capacitive electrodes where the input uh, coupling capacitors are part of the electrode itself, then this uh, structure obviously doesn't work. So, um, so we could place the um, choppers within the feedback loop, so we can use explicit or um, uh, electrode-based capacitors as our input couplers uh, over here. But as we just mentioned, this parasitic switch capacitor resistance uh, generates noise, which requires the use of very large C-in capacitors, 
um, again, which is big, uh, which defeats kind of the purpose that we're, that we're aiming for here. So this is not uh, a good solution either. So one solution that uh, uh, my student and I came up with is, you know, we like being able to use our input coupling capacitors because they passively reject the electrode offset voltage. Um, it's very compatible with uh, electrodes that may be capacitive, for example, that we could uh, leverage. But there was no architecture uh, previously that would allow us to also chop with the capacitors right in front. So what we ended up doing here is we ended up placing the choppers. So let's just write this down. We said we placed the chopper after C in, but before the feedback loop. Uh, or in other words, we placed it at the virtual ground. Okay, so basically what we're doing here is kind of like we're doing current mode amplification. So we pass through our coupling capacitors and nominally there's, there's a ground there. So the, the input voltage is converted to a current. Uh, and when it's in the current domain, that's when we chop. Okay, so we chop there um, and then we go through our, um, what's now a, a current mode amplifier. And then after we're done that current mode amplifier, we chop down and then we pass it through an integrator and we get a nice voltage mode output. Okay, so this approach also works. We have a publication if you're interested in, in reading about it. There are several uh, trade-offs associated with this architecture. Uh, of course, now you need an op amp with the full bandwidth because you're not chopping down until after the op amp. Although perhaps, uh, you know, that might be a nice project idea. Could you figure out how to chop within this op amp and alleviate that problem? Um, you know, there's a, there's a few issues um, associated with this. So if you're interested, you can uh, go ahead and, and, and read that paper. There are other uh, possible solutions to this problem. Um, and one of these other solutions is, hey, you know what? Why do we even need feedback? We typically want feedback in a circuit so that we can set the gain uh, based on a ratio of capacitors, as an example, uh, so that we can set it with you know, some degree of precision. But it's really the feedback that's messing everything up. We need, uh, if we have the feedback, then, then we, it's hard for us to chop uh, because then that uh, generates all sorts of uh, input impedance problems or it generates switch capacitor resistive noise, you know, things like this. So one idea um, is let's just not do feedback for the purpose of setting gain. Let's run our amplifiers open loop. Let's build a GMC amplifier and the gain is set by GM times C, okay? And um, that will vary with process variation, with temperature, with supply voltage variation, and so on. But if you can have, if you can afford some sort of calibration, then maybe that's good enough. So in this particular case on, on, on the left by uh, Ricky Mueller, um, what they did here is they chop before the uh, coupling capacitors Again, note that that does pose an input impedance issue. Um, but then they amplify through this GMC circuit and then go right into a ADC. The output of the ADC goes through a filter and a DAC, um, which is used to uh, servo out any uh, electrode offset uh, voltages that would get up converted through the choppers here. Uh, in this particular design, they were able to achieve a very small area. Um, in a design that uh, my student and I did uh, a few years after this is we basically use this similar kind of architecture, uh, but uh, noting that the uh, feedback DAC in the prior approach uh, was really what was kind of consuming a large portion of the area. Uh, these capacitors need to be physically big for matching purposes and so on. And so we ended up going with a mostly digital approach where we take a input voltage, we chop it up, we convert it into the current domain, chop it down, and then we use that as the input to a ring oscillator or to a pair of ring oscillators that are used as a VCO based analog to digital converter, which creates a digital output, which when then we uh, feed back through to the input using a current mode uh, digital to analog converter, again, to filter out any um, electrode offset voltages that get up converted through the chopping. And in this particular case, we were able to get a, a very small area per channel.
Now, one of the other challenges that uh, we're facing with modern um, front end design is that of dynamic range and motion artifacts. So if you're building a wearable device and the person is moving around, that um, will cause what we call motion artifacts. Um, and this is caused by changing of electrode impedances, it's caused by triboelectricity and so on. And if the front end dynamic range is not large enough, this can cause saturation, okay? If the linearity of your circuit isn't large enough, then even if your dynamic range is, you still may um, lose signal information because you're now distorting the signal as opposed to just capturing the motion artifacts. So what we really want as we're kind of moving into uh, more realistic scenarios uh, on recording biopotentials on patients uh, undergoing motion is we really want some robustness um, to this uh, front end variation. We want a very large dynamic range and ideally a very good linearity. So it turns out that you can't really do this with a conventional design. And what I mean by conventional is you have your low noise instrumentation amplifier followed by an analog to digital converter. And the reason is, is if your LNA has a gain of 100 volts per volt, then you know uh, if you're operating over some nominal supply voltage, you just don't have that much room left in your ADC to, to digitize it. So your ADC is really limited to you know 10 bits or something like this. So it's very difficult to get dynamic range over um, uh, with, with this particular approach. So what people have been doing recently is going to what we call an ADC direct architecture. And this is basically by including the amplifier within the feedback loop of the ADC, typically built as some sort of delta sigma type of ADC, such that the uh, di dynamic range is, is kind of implicit uh, within the, the, the ADC itself. And so this is a way that we can get 14 or more bits of resolution uh, from our ADC um, or from our ADC direct uh, front end, I guess. Um, challenges still remain on how you get high input impedance, how you get low input referred noise and, and, and so on. So the basic idea is, is this. Um, we still are really uh, concerned with flicker noise. So we do chopping, we chop, uh, we pass through some input coupling capacitors and then we go into an amplifier, okay? Uh, but through that amplifier, instead of then taking that amplifier and passing it through a normal analog to digital converter, we put it right into a comparator uh, that is part of a delta sigma analog to digital converter, uh, which is something that uh, we won't really study in this course, but uh, if you're interested, uh, there are other courses uh, that you can take that, that discuss this. So the idea here is you take the output of the delta sigma converter, you pass it through a feedback loop. This feedback loop helps uh, filter out uh, electrode offset voltages and so on. And it's also functioning as part of the analog to digital converter itself. Uh, but doing it this way, at least uh, in this particular paper with the auto ranging feature, you end up getting a uh, limited amount of linearity here, which limits your ability to easily filter out any of these motion artifacts because the motion artifacts are, are creating um, distortions in your signal. So one other way to consider doing this instead of going to an explicit delta sigma converter is to go to a VCO based analog to digital converter. The idea with a VCO based analog to digital converter is you take your input voltage, you typically convert it into a current, although that's not strictly necessary depending on how your VCO is created. And uh, if, if your input voltage changes, then the frequency of your VCO changes correspondingly. And then it's easy to uh, count the frequency of your VCO through some phase decoder and that creates your digital output. It turns out that doing this gives you inherent first order noise shaping, uh, which is a nice property um, inherited from delta sigma based ADCs. In addition, these sort of structures are very, what we call scaling friendly. Uh, and what we mean by that is there's not that many analog circuits. Uh, the performance of these circuits is usually tied to the performance of the digital blocks. And so it's easy to implement these in a very scaled CMOS process where digital is, is very good. Okay, so we like VCO ADCs for that reason. We can easily integrate these sort of ADCs onto a very scaled um, CMOS process where you might have your digital SOC and, and other things here.
The downside of VCO-based ADCs is that they are nonlinear. Okay, the VCO has a very nonlinear voltage to frequency conversion process. Okay, in addition, the gain, uh, in this case modeled by KVCO of the, of the VCO, is also sensitive to temperature, supply voltage variation, and so on. Uh, and so as a result, we typically need some sort of calibration uh, to deal with this. So one way that uh, my uh, student and I published uh, recently to deal with this is something called differential pulse code modulation, or DPCM. This is a coding technique that had been used uh, mostly in um, compression uh, for transmitting, say, speech, video, and, and so on and so forth. And the idea here is you take your input signal, you, quanti you quantize it, and then in order to reduce the bits seen at the output, what you do is you make an estimate of what the signal um, will be in the next cycle. This is through this predictor block. And then you subtract that from the actual input signal uh, to create an error signal in front of your quantizer. So the, the, the value of this error signal should become ideally very small. Um, and, and as a result, your quantizer is operating over a much smaller error, uh, region of operation, hopefully a much more linear region of operation. Okay, so this only works if you do have high correlation between successive input samples. Okay, but again, the nice thing is, is if you do it this way, you're only having your quantizer uh, process a very small prediction error. As a result, you should be able to get very small swing and operate in a nice linear region. So this is how we apply uh, this differential pulse code modulation technique to VCO-based ADCs. We have our input signal. It creates, uh, we pass it into a, a VCO quantizer. Um, the output of this quantizer is digital bits. We pass the digital bits through a predictor uh, and into a DAC, which creates this V error signal, which should have very small signal swing. So as a result, if we're looking at the uh, V to F uh, curve of a uh, VCO, it has some nonlinearity non here, well, we're only exercising this very small region over here as an example. So it's a very nice, uh, nicely linear uh, region. And if we oversample, we make sure that we have high correlation between the input samples. Um, this is a great fit. Okay, so the idea here is, um, well, uh, shown on this slide with a little bit more details, uh, we, we chop, uh, we go through our input coupling capacitors, which means we're going to need the feedback to cancel out the um, um, electrode offset voltages and so on. We go through a voltage to current converter and again into a three stage ring VCO with a phase decoder. And then we have all sorts of digital logic here. I'm not gonna get into the details here. We have a gain cor error correction circuit to make sure that the, the, the gain through the circuit is, is what we would expect it to be. Uh, but basically the idea here is you have a capacitive feedback DAC that, uh, that feeds back uh, signals here to make sure that the error signal is less than in this case, uh, two millivolts uh, peak. Um, and that really allows us to use a very um, small region of the V to F uh, curve and allows us to get very good linearity. So here's a, a, a um, transistor level circuit uh, schematic of the V to I converter. In this case, what we're doing is we have a um, differential pair that's doing current reuse. So we have both a PMOS device over here and an NMOS device over here. So the transconductance of our circuit is effectively doubled. Uh, in this case, we have cascode devices to mitigate the effects of the Miller effect. Uh, there's a few other details like a dead band switch and so on um, that, that we uh, won't have time to talk about. But basically what we're doing here is building a transconductor. Uh, the output goes into a current mirror that then goes to the, uh, to the ring oscillators. So the nice thing about this particular circuit is it's relatively small. It's not super small, not as small as our previous circuit. Uh, the power consumption is quite low, 3.2 microwatts. The input referred noise over 500 Hertz of bandwidth is 1.2 microvolt RMS. And most importantly, our dynamic range is 94 dB. Um, so this allows us to really operate with uh, extremely large, in the, in the presence of extremely large motion artifacts, 
without uh, impacting our ability to capture the underlying signal. And importantly, with a pretty good um, linearity, our signal, uh, our SNDR is 88 dB in this particular design. Um, so this allows us to have uh, a very high level of performance and easily filter out those motion artifacts simply by a, a simple high pass filter. So that concludes our discussions on instrumentation amplifiers. And uh, now we're going to shift uh, our focus in this course to some more application specific details.